So my name is Erica Joy Baker, and I work on many things, uh, both as a senior engineering manager at Patreon, um, and also as a, shall we say, vocal advocate for diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. And also, I am not a creator. Um, I couldn't draw a circle if, it, uh, if my life depended on it. Um, and my greatest musical accomplishment to this point is being able to play chopsticks on the piano. Um, but I'm getting to the point where I can play the Steven Universe theme song on a ukulele, so, you know. Um, so working at Patreon, to me, is super important because I get to help people who are creative uh, share their gifts with the world. I think art is super important in the world. I think people who create that art are very important. And if I can't create that art, I want to empower the people who can. Um, and I promise that my talk is not a 20-minute pitch on Patreon, so bear with me here. Um, so I've worked at several places, and I am actively recruited to work at many, many more. But I stay at Patreon because I believe we can actually change the world. Unlike the companies who say they're changing the world, but really they're, they're like providing you know, drone technology to the government, we're changing the world for the better. Um, and I think we are positioned to change the world for the better for those who have been historically, system, systemically disenfranchised by our society. And I wasn't expecting that, Paula, thank you. Right, so I did not start my work life at Patreon. Um, this is me, working in my first ever tech job. Um, I think I was probably scowling at a, at a server or some such. Um, this is me at 21 years old, living in Fairbanks, Alaska, making about $40,000 a year, freshly dropped out of college. Um, see, to me, making 40 grand a year was a great alternative to racking up more student loans and uh, working full time to try to get my degree, um, the degree I should have gotten. And why well, should have gotten, Erica? I know that's what you're thinking. Um, <laughs> because according to the lore of our country, of the United States, you will graduate from college if you get good grades, which I did. Uh, if you get good test scores, I did that too. And if you're highly intelligent, which I am based on some common testing measures by uh, organization, I won't name out loud because it feels weird. Um, <laughs> But that lore assumes one thing, that you have money. And since I've been talking a lot about myself here, I'm going to continue in that vein. Um, it's not a Patreon pitch, I promise you that. Um, here's another thing about me. I am super into genealogy. I am the biggest genealogy nerd. Um, I dare anybody to like fight me on that. Um, but this is my family tree, um, which I've traced pretty far back. And so I know it pretty well, because I've been working on it for over a decade. Um, so I promise you that there is no money growing on that tree. <laughs> That's because there is no generational wealth in my family. Um, many of the folks in this generation were slaves, and so they were restricted from earning money. Many of the folks in this generation lost all their money when the Freedmen's Bank collapsed. Um, this was pre-FDIC insurance, so they put their money in a bank, and it was gone. And many of the folks in this generation, uh, through Jim Crow, uh, were prevented from getting good jobs, and through redlining, were prevented from home ownership. So, no generational wealth to be found anywhere in my tree. But my family isn't unique in this. This is a story for many black people in the United States. Um, many black families lack the generational wealth that has been available to white families. And in fact, I will read from a slide, which you're never supposed to do in a talk, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, if current economic trends continue, the average black household will need 228 years to accumulate as much wealth as their white counterparts hold today. For the average Latino family, it will take 84 years. Absent significant policy interventions or a seismic change in the American economy, people of color will never close the gap. 228 years. For my family, that's roughly nine generations down the line for me. So that's my great, 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 great grandkids uh, who will have the amount of wealth that white families have right now. This is not okay. I also want to call attention to this part of that quote. Um, if current economic trends continue, 
That means if things stay just as they are, if they just keep going, if they stay the same, then it will take that full 228 years and the full nine generations for my family to have the generational wealth that white families have right now. But things can get worse. We've seen them get worse. They have been getting worse since slavery. This is also not okay. But remember how I'm a diversity and inclusion advocate? I left out one word. I am also a diversity, inclusion, and equity advocate. That to say, it would be completely against everything I value and stand for to do work that furthers inequity and widens the generational or the racial wealth gap. I flat out refuse to do it, and so I want to make sure Patreon doesn't contribute to it. But let's go back to this quote. People of color will never close the gap absent significant policy interventions or, and this is the part I really love about this, a seismic change in the American economy. Right? So, <laughs> seismic change in the economy? Yeah. Uh, I feel like we're trying to change the world by getting creators paid. I think that's also a seismic change in the economy. So if we're going to change the world and we're going to get creators paid, I'm asking that we make sure to mind the gap. And I mean specifically that we recognize that if we are only slightly, even just a little bit effective in our mission, we will have some impact on that racial wealth gap. But if we are very effective, and I'm certain we will be, because that's why I work at Patreon, uh, we will be one of the major sources of that seismic change. And we will either make things much better, or we will make it way, way worse. Um, and I want us to make it better. Um, but that's going to take some really concerted effort and actively looking at some hard truths. Truth the first. Companies aiming to change the world for creators are predominantly led by white men. Here's where I remind you that though I work at Patreon, I am not speaking on behalf of Patreon here when I tell you that our entire executive leadership team is made of men and that most of them are white. I am also not speaking on behalf of Patreon when I say the same is probably true of Kickstarter and YouTube and Facebook and any other technical platform aimed at creators. This is problematic because we've seen what happens in tech companies that are run by mostly white men. They unintentionally mess up in some really major ways. The examples here are just the really egregious examples, the ones that made the news. Um, you see that Google called black people gorillas, and Apple's watch didn't work for black people, and Snapchat decided that digital blackface was a good thing. Um, those are really egregious, but the problems show up in a little bit subtler ways too, right? So continuously pumping out delivery services that only work in San Francisco and New York instead of addressing, I don't know, the food deserts in Oakland and Chicago and Detroit, where mostly people of color live and can't get fresh food. I don't know. Maybe think about that if there are any tech people in the audience. Um, <laughs> lack of representation, people of color, tends to show up in ways that are really obvious, like the ones that I pointed out before. Um, but there are ways that they show up that are really, aren't really obvious except to other people of color. And I want to remind you once again, before I go to this next slide, I am not speaking on behalf of Patreon right now. These are videos aimed at introducing creators to both Kickstarter and Patreon. And I'm just going to let these play for a little bit and let you watch the images that show up on screen. Things that make us laugh. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it on, really easy for creators to get paid. We're using the idea of Patreon, project, which is actually a really old idea. Exactly, Jack. If it weren't for patrons, we wouldn't have Romy from Juliet or Mona Lisa. Right. Pay attention to who you see in these videos. And you'll notice that there are many creators represented here in these videos, but not so many creators of color. And when I first saw the Patreon video on the right, my first thought was, well, this is a platform for white people and Issa Rae. Um, but now I know that's not the case for Patreon because, in fact, when I ask people on Twitter to tell me about their favorite creators of color, aside from the predictable divorce from the current reality we live in, it doesn't matter what their skin color is. Um, 
I got over 70 responses just from that one tweet uh, of creators of color that were on Patreon, right? So they are there. And even if I just go by the people that I'm personally a patron of, I know that there are people of color on Patreon, we just don't see them represented well. Um, and the biggest, please come be on our platform asset that exists, uh, which leads to truth number two. We're not trying as hard as we could or should be to reach creators of color. <laughs> Typing this made me feel a little dejected because, you know, I'm a diversity and inclusion advocate and I really champion uh, improving things for people of color in the world and in the industry. And so I'm betting some of y'all are feeling that dejectedness and sadness too. And I'm sorry, it sucks. And all of us can do better by actively reaching out to creators of color. And I'm certain folks who happen to work on one of these platforms think, oh, but it's hard. And you're right, it is hard. But if we're going to affect seismic economic change, I really love that phrase so much, um, <laughs> it's not going to be easy. But we'll come back to this. OK, truth number three is hard to swallow. And this is borne out by data. The average value of a business owned by a person of color is less than the average value of a business owned by a white person. So, what this says is like if you reach out to do the, if you do the work to reach out to creators of color and convince them to build and run their membership businesses on your platform, their businesses are statistically likely to be worth less than that of a white person, unless you take great measures to ensure that their businesses have a great chance of success. And remember the equity in this slide? Some of you have probably seen this graphic in places before, um, but it never hurts to see it again. Uh, to keep the racial wealth gap the same, we'll have to do, we, uh, stick with equality. You know, we can just give everybody the same thing and the gap will stay the, the way it is. But to change the wealth gap, to change the world, we need equity. Um, we need to focus on equity and helping people who are lower or in lower statuses or you know, ha don't have as much get to where they need to be. We have to give them a boost. So we have to give creators of color that boost. But, since our companies are run by white men, we cannot lean on our own understanding for how to give the people of color what they need. We have to go out and talk to creators of color to ask them how we can better show up for them specifically and then build tools and processes to make that happen. And once again, yeah, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be really worth it. Because if we change this truth and we start reaching out to creators of color and building and improving our tools and processes to support creators of color, a nice bonus is that we end up improving our tools and processes for all creators. So when we figure out how best to help Geneva, a young, gifted, and black woman living in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, turn her 85,000 Instagram followers and 2,400 YouTube subscribers into backers and patrons, we not only solve that problem for her, we solve it for everybody else who's in her same position. And as you start enabling the Genevas of the world, you have a better chance of making this truth a little less true. Because you're not only enabling her to be more successful, you're also increasing the likelihood that future Genevas will be thought of as potentially successful, and people will fund them more. And then you put them on the path to becoming the next Isis, who will create TV shows that I watch religiously. OK, so we're all on the change the way the creators get paid, close the racial wealth gap, seismic change in the economy train. We're all there, right? But we don't know how to do it. Uh, we don't know how to start reaching out to creators of color to help support them. I have an answer, but first a reminder. I'm an engineer, so the following answer may get a little into the technical weeds, and I apologize for that in advance. To figure out how best to serve creators of color on your platform, ask them. <laughs> this is the Stack Overflow Developer Survey, a survey that Stack Overflow runs once a year in which they ask any developer who visits their site all about themselves. As a result of this, not only does Stack Overflow have a good idea of who they're serving, they, they know who they're not serving. And you can survey too. In fact, you should survey because you will never know if your platform is widening or shrinking the racial wealth gap, unless you have the data. 
Um, and not only do you get a comprehensive look at who really uses your platform, right? So we see Stack Overflow predominantly used by white people, um, but we knew that because it's tech. Um, <laughs> not only do you get a comprehensive look at who really uses your platform and how well you're serving them, you can ask people if they're comfortable being contacted, and then suddenly you have a group of people who you're able to reach out to to ask how you can better serve them. And so because I do what I do with diversity and inclusion in the tech industry, I get, a lot, I get asked a lot about recruiting, and I am very familiar with the response, we tried to reach out to people of color, but they didn't respond. This is because people of color are tired of your shit. <laughs> and I don't mean you personally, I mean you as a part of, society, of a society that has treated them, or have, who has taken every opportunity to treat them poorly, I mean, come on, with the ice shit going on right now. Um, after generations of being mistreated, people of color are rightfully wary and suspicious, and the standard outreach methods that you use to reach out to them may not work. So here are some things that you might want to try instead. First, change your squad. Consider that the makeup of your team or organization, remember that most of them run and led by white men, uh, might be telegraphing a lot about you and who you care about. Um, so con consider changing that before you reach out. Knock three times. Um, reach out. Reach out again. And then reach out a third time. Because people of color, again, tired of your shit. That one time you knock, you're going to be like, eh, they're probably full of it, just like everybody else who has mistreated me in the society. But, you know, show them that you actually care, instead of just assuming that they don't care because they didn't respond to you the first time. Finally, take the no. If they say no during any of those times you reach out, believe them, thank them for their time, and then give them a way to reach out back to you if they want to participate later. Because remember, you might very well be an untrustworthy representative of a capitalist society that has constantly abused them for its own gain. So if you don't take no for an answer, you are just proving that you are indeed not worthy of that trust. And if you do all the right things, and get a good group of people together who are willing to spend their time and energy and labor to help your platform change and get creators paid, hey, listen, listen to them. Really listen, because they might tell you something unexpected about your, your platform or your marketing or the way you're engaging right then and there. And you might get a little bit of feels about it. It might make you feel a little defensive. Like, what are they? I know my platform. What are they telling me? Let that pass. Uh, because since you're here listening to me, for I think another two minutes or so, uh, you're going to be prepared for this. And you're going to say, Erica prepared me for this defensive feeling I'm feeling right now, and I'm able to let it pass and really accept this feedback that I've worked so very hard to get. And that's when you get to the good stuff. That's when you get to the game-changing, platform level-upping information that nobody else has because they're too busy doing user experience research with groups of predominantly white people. <laughs> because listen, I'm going to be honest with you, Getting a whole bunch of white creators paid is cool, and it will change a portion of the world. But it won't be that seismic economic change in the economy that we want to see. I had to do that, I'm sorry, seismic, <laughs> I'm just shaking. Um, when you do the work to ensure that creators of color are represented, supported, and championed on your platform, and you really mind that racial wealth gap in all your decision making, that's when you really start making the world move. My name is Erica Baker. Thank you for listening to me. You can find me at erica at patreon.com. Hello at ericabaker.com and at Erica Joy. Hi.